Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. There was a certain rich man who clothed himself in purple and fine linen and feasted luxuriously every day. At his gate, there was a certain poor man named Lazarus who was covered in sores. Lazarus longed to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Instead, the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried by angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. While he was being tormented in the place of the dead, the rich man looked up and saw Abraham in the distance with Lazarus by his side. He shouted, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the water to cool my tongue, for I'm suffering in this flame. Abraham said, My child, remember that during your lifetime you received great things, but Lazarus received terrible things. Now he is being comforted, comforted and, and you are in great pain. The rich man said, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers. He must warn them so that they do not come to this place of agony. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Surely they will listen to them. The rich man said, no, Father Abraham. But if someone from the dead should come to them, then their hearts and lives will be changed. Abraham said, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded if someone should rise from the dead. The word of God from the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you, Chris, for helping the scriptures come alive and for doing it at all three services. <laughs> it's a shame to not be a good steward of that uh, involvement. Let's bow in prayer. Holy Spirit, move in our midst that these ancient words might through the power of your living word become life for us. Open our ears and our minds and our hearts so that we might hear what you have to say to each of us today. Lord, use my words and get me out of the way so that we might see and hear you for your life's sake for us. Amen. So if it weren't for the Gospel of Luke, we would be missing some very wonderful stories. The Good Samaritan, only found in the Gospel of Luke. The Prodigal Son, only found in the Gospel of Luke. A number of others, including today's rather challenging passage, only found in the Gospel of Luke. Today's passage obviously deals with uh, what to do with wealth, among other things. There is a folk tale, a German folk tale adapted in the Brothers Grimm collection of uh, fairy tales about a rich man and a poor farmer. Now they both died at about the same time, went to heaven at about the same time, arrived in the waiting room and took their seats. St. Peter came greeted the rich man, escorted him to the gate, and walked him through. The poor farmer tagged along so that he could peer through the slats of the fence and figure out what to expect. Oh, it looked good. There were crowds that were cheering, an awful lot of uh, confetti being thrown in the air, a great deal of excitement. There was music. At the time the story was retold, it was a Bach chorale. Perhaps it would be different, although I think Bach is timeless. 
that's my um, adaptation. It didn't show up originally. The, the bot did, never mind. Anyway. <laughs> And St. Peter said to the rich man, welcome to heaven, make yourself at home, and send him on down the street. The rich man, or the, the poor farmer, was quite eager after having seen this, and when he was escorted in, he discovered that it was a more modest welcome. No choir, no music, some warm applause, but not all of the riotous exuberance that had greeted the rich man. Now, Peter's words were the same. Welcome to heaven. Make yourself at home. And before the poor farmer got ready to walk down the street, he's turned to St. Peter and said, of all of the places where I would have expected discrimination, this is not one of them. Why was he greeted with such celebration and I was not? St. Peter said, now, let me reassure you, all of the treatment will be just the same. But you see, for us, today was a special occasion. We get poor farmers all the time. <laughs> I love it when you connect the dots before I have to actually say, and therefore. <laughs> As St. Peter went on and he said, it's been 80 years since we had a rich man. <laughs> it's an old story. The tension and the contrast between rich and poor is not new. Whether it's a folk tale that goes back 200 years or a Bible story that goes back nearly 2,000 years, the contrast is real. Today's story uh, ha happens in three scenes. The first two of them are just vignettes. The first begins with the rich man and the poor man in life. Now, the rich man wears purple, and purple was not just one of the choices of colors back then. Purple was an extravagant and expensive and hard to obtain dye. Therefore, it was limited to royalty and other really rich folks who could afford the purple. And he dressed in linen. Purple and linen was shorthand for saying he had the cream of the crop in terms of clothing. And he ate sumptuously, not just adequately, not just nicely, but he feasted over and over. In contrast to him, there is the poor man. He's the only character in any parable who has a name, Lazarus. It might even be a word play because it, it, in its roots, it means God helps. And God knows he needed the help. He's, he was at the edge of the property. We might think of it as the end of the driveway or the edge of the neighborhood. Wherever the gate was, that was as close as Lazarus could get. Close enough to know that inside there were scraps from that feast that he literally and figuratively hungered for. But he doesn't ever get the scraps the dogs probably get the scraps, and the dogs come out. And Lazarus is not dressed in purple and fine linen. He doesn't even have bandages to cover his sores. Instead, he is open-skinned, open to the world, and the dogs come, and in what is a disgusting detail, the dogs come and lick his sores. It, it, yeah, it, 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 it's awful. That's the first scene. Lovely place to switch. Then comes the scene of the two of them in death. And their positions are reversed. Lazarus died, and he has the best of all possible pallbearers without having to actually have a pall. And he is whisked off to the side of Abraham, Father Abraham's bosom. It's the seat of honor. The, it is the next best seat in the house next to Abraham. The rich man, it says, was buried. Kind of like in the creed, died and was buried. That was all that is said about it. We don't know it, what kind of fanfare or ceremony there might have been. We do know that the next uh, place he finds himself is a miserable place. He appears to be in torment, and a part of the torment is that he can see 
what's happening with Lazarus. And he knows it's not happening for him. Sometimes just being able to observe how someone else is being treated is its own kind of misery, and it sure is for him. Now, scene three finally at least gets dialogue, if not actual action. The rich man is uncomfortable, miserable, and he's not familiar with that, and he doesn't like it a bit. So he looks up and pleads with Father Abraham to send Lazarus down to provide some relief. It's kind of interesting that he's still concerned with his own comfort and really doesn't see the uh, other person, Lazarus, as anything other than incidental or perhaps a useful errand boy. But Abraham doesn't... Um, he acknowledges him, but he can't give him what he wants. He says, the situation simply reversed. Remember that when you were alive, you got all the good stuff, and he got all the terrible stuff. Now, it's reversed. He's got the good stuff, you've got the terrible stuff, and there is this huge grand canyon of a gap between us and he can't cross over to you, and none of you can come over to us. It is the way it is. It's finished. Now, the rich man apparently now starts to develop a little bit of concern for someone other than himself. He has five brothers. So he hopes that perhaps Abraham can send Lazarus, if he can't come all the way over to where the rich man is, could he at least go back to their father's house? Could he go and warn his five brothers? The rich man apparently knows enough about their circumstances to know that they're really headed for the same path he was headed. And Abraham says, no, they've, they've got the scriptures. Let them pay attention to those. With the uh, inference that that really is sufficient. Now the rich man knows that just that information didn't work for him. He had the same information. So he wants them to have not just the information, but something a little more dramatic and spectacular and says, if someone comes back from the dead, that should get their attention. That should motivate them to repent, to change their hearts and lives. He's more optimistic about their willingness to do that than Abraham is. Because Abraham says, no, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if somebody rises from the dead. Now, two parenthetical comments here. This is just a story. It is not a documentary on what happens after we die. The details are not reliable here any more than the details in the folk tale. They're simply using the common beliefs of that day as a backdrop to make a different point. Other parenthetical observation. I do know of a story where someone does come back from the dead and it is persuasive after three tries. Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. Scrooge finally does get the point and repents, which is to say changes his heart and life. But the point in this story is not so optimistic. The story has two linked themes. One has to do with living safely with wealth. The other has to do with reading and understanding scripture. At first they don't necessarily seem to link up. However, had we started a little earlier in the passage, we'd have been reminded that Jesus told the story with a very clear audience in mind. He told it to Pharisees. That is shorthand for folks who know the Bible really well. It'd be like uh, speaking to a uh, Sunday school teacher convention. Folks who know the story and who laughed at his teaching on money. Right before this, he had been telling a story and said, you cannot serve both God and wealth. And the Pharisees thought that was ludicrous. They did that every day. What did he mean they couldn't serve them both? They were able to serve both quite well, from their point of view. And it served them quite well. 
They made sure of that. One of the realities of scripture is that if you read it with an eye toward making a particular point, you can find a lot of different perspectives there. And depending on where you read, there's a lot of support for the Pharisees' position that wealth was fine. Indeed, it was a sign of God's blessing. Deuteronomy 28, <laughs> most of the chapter, uh, but the, the, the chapter begins, Now, if you really obey the Lord your God's voice by carefully keeping all his commandments, which they did, by the way, then the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. The word there is really given to the people of Israel as a group, and then it goes on to get personal. You will be blessed. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the field. Your own fertility, your soil's produce, your livestock's offspring, the young of both cattle and flocks, the cows and the sheep. You will be blessed in your basket and your kneading bowl. You will be blessed when you are out and blessed when you come back. It goes on and on and has a lot of different circumstances. Ranging from God pouring out the rain at the right time to bringing in the harvest and having many, many material blessings. <coughs> Psalm 1. The righteous who live by God's word will be, will be like the tree that is planted by the water. They will flourish. Their leaves won't wither. They will, they will be abundant. There are many, many strands of this sense that if you live the right life, the righteous, obedient life, then, then you will be blessed and it will be reflected with material blessings. And friends, that's not just an olden days idea. You can find the prosperity gospel woven throughout our culture. And there's this subtle equation that goes on. If you're righteous, you'll be blessed. And then you can flip it around and say, well, if I am materially blessed, then that means I'm probably living a righteous life. And those who aren't as fortunate probably aren't. And maybe I shouldn't help them because I might be interfering with God's punishment and plans for their lives. There are folks who reason that way. And the Pharisees and probably this rich man were among them. And on the other hand, there are many, many scriptural calls for justice and the direction to be generous to those who are in need. Earlier in Deuteronomy, there was the reminder, I write a sticky note here, That the poor will never disappear from the earth. And that's why I'm giving you this command. You must open your hand generously to three categories of people here. Your fellow Israelites, to the needy among you, and to the poor who live with you in your land. Those would be the immigrants or the refugees. Very clear direction. And over in Leviticus, when the advice is given about the harvest, it says, when you harvest your land's produce, this is Leviticus 19, 9 and 10, you must not harvest all the way to the edge. Don't gather up every remaining bit of your harvest. Do not pick your vineyard clean or gather up all the grapes that have fallen. Leave these items for the poor and the immigrant. So not just the scraps after it is prepared and on the table, but the leftovers around the edges earlier are directed to be available for the poor. In Proverbs 14, 31, those who oppress the poor insult their maker, but those who are kind to the needy honor him. And in Isaiah, after the prophet has uh, uh, roundly criticized the sort of show of religion without the genuine content of it, he goes on to say in Isaiah 58, 6 and 7, Is this not the fast that I choose? To loose the chains of injustice, set the oppressed free, to share your bread with the hungry, to shelter the wanderer, to clothe the naked? Oh, there's a lot of references throughout Moses which is 
described as the law and throughout the prophets and in the wisdom literature of Proverbs and others. And then if we listen to Jesus, as we have been listening to Luke, uh, Luke's gospel the last some weeks, over and over again, Jesus' parables reinforce that God's ways are not our ways and that very often our ways are not God's ways. And that God is going to bring the last, as the world defines them, to the head of the line and send those who assume that they've got an E pass, E for excellence, of course, that will get them to the front of the line, that no, they're going to be at the back. God's guest list includes all of those the world ignores. And those who assume that they would be at the head table discover that they are invited to the banquet only through God's mercy. Not because of their report cards or their resumes or their balance sheets. Not through their own work and merit, but only because of God's grace. Jesus is telling a very countercultural story here. To a culture in his day that values wealth and comfort and accepts indifference to the needy or to our culture or to any culture that is comfortable. Jesus says, in effect, if you won't cross over the gap between the rich and the poor while you are alive, well, you just better cross over that gap while you are alive in this life because in the next one, there's going to be a much more significant gap and there's not going to be any crossing back and forth then. It's a hard passage. John Wesley had his own set of advice about how to deal with wealth, even modest wealth. He was discovering the phenomenon that as those who were coming to faith were joined together in groups weekly and they met with each other to support each other in their faith journey and to help each other lead responsible and righteous lives, that by golly, folks who were giving up alcohol and, and, and able to be um, responsible were going to work, they were earning paychecks, and they were accumulating wealth, which Wesley thought was very risky. So he warns about the effects of abundance. He says that they tempt us to seek happiness outside of God. They lead us to think better of ourselves than we do of others who have less. That wealth, he says, encourages many foolish and hurtful desires and deceives persons into trusting their own self-sufficiency, forgetting that God is the source of all. Whew! And in his own sermon on this passage, yay for the internet, you know, you can go and Google, end up at the John Wesley Center online and find out what he's preached on. And about this passage, he says, it is no more sinful to be rich than to be poor. Well, yay, that's good news, because I have a feeling that by his standards, yeah. No more sinful to be rich than to be poor, but, he says, it is dangerous beyond expression. Therefore, I remind all of you of this number that have the conveniences of life and something over. The conveniences of life and something over that ye walk upon slippery ground. Then he gets really fierce and says, ye continually tread on snares and death and ye are every moment on the verge of hell. Oh. This is a hard story to read and hear and a hard one to preach. I probably should have called those of you with the medical background to find out how do you deliver news that you know people don't want to hear? Yes, you can live if you will give up and then you get out the checklist of all the ways in which your lifestyle needs to change. Folks are never really very eager to get that list. As a matter of fact, some folks look down that list and say, well, shoot, if I've got to give all that, I'll just go ahead and die young. 9.30, we had someone raise their hand and say that. <laughs> that was the... It is hard. And yet, 
very important. There's no indication that the rich man was not a nice guy. No indication that he was um, unkind or dishonest. But he is a vivid example of one of the side effects of abundance. Did you know that it causes blindness? A sort of localized blindness that means you cannot see the need on your doorstep. And he could not. He had the inability to see or respond and apparently just doesn't notice unless something is within his comfort zone. I thought it really ironic yesterday. I was kind of joking with Jim about it. This is, this is a hard passage to be thinking about. And then in the mailbox arrives the Land's End catalog and the North Style catalog. And just out of sheer reflex, I start leafing through and looking at coats I don't need because the weather here isn't that cold, but oh, they are just beautiful. The abundance is seductive. How much is enough? Oh, a little more. How much is too much? I don't know, but I'm not there yet. It's just enticing. So what should this rich guy have done? Well, if he had watched the children's skits this morning, he would have said, I should notice the need and respond. Be prepared to be able to respond. That third traveler had resources to share and was willing to. It probably would have done the rich guy a little bit of good had he been concerned a little bit more right outside his family circle. Concern for his brothers was a good start, but it took him a hard journey to just get there. Better he should have practiced that journey and cared for others a little beyond that. Oh, and his attitude about Lazarus? He either didn't see him at all, never seemed to learn his name, and then he saw him as his errand boy. Just something useful. Someone who could do what he needed, not someone with their own needs and dignity. But the most fundamental thing that would have made the difference for him, I think, would have been if he had paid attention to his own scripture. He knew it. He knew it. He could have paid attention and acted on the very unmistakable scriptural call to be generous. The two themes of this passage, what do we do with wealth and reading and understanding scripture, really are woven together in this way. And it's, it's a hard warning. To center our lives on the comforts of material goods is to reject the scriptural demands for justice and generosity. And, in case we hadn't gotten it, it has long-term consequences. The text poses the question of what's really central in our lives? In what do we most fundamentally hope and trust? Have we placed our hope in the right things? Or do we need to reframe it and place it in the proper place? Now the point is not to have no possessions. There is one character in scripture where Jesus says, now you, yeah, you need to sell everything and give it all to the poor. But that, that is not the universal prescription. More often it has to do with whatever you have, use it well and wisely for God's purposes. But it really comes back down to what's most central. Our own comfort, and God is peripheral to that? Or are we placing our trust in God's ways as revealed in Scripture? And then our possessions no longer possess us. So what then should we do? 
Well, probably to see and respond to the needs at our doorstep. Knowing that the internet has moved the gate. It's no longer at the end of the driveway or the edge of the neighborhood or the community. Instead, the gate comes all the way in on our monitors and screens. And we can discover needs both near and far. Whether it is those who walk into the Barnabas Center and need the food and assistance that this community provides through that, or to Micah's house, or whether they eat dinner at uh, the Hope House through the Interfaith Dinner Network, or whether they are orphans in Kenya, or the poor in Guatemala or Appalachia, anyone who's been in our mission trip has had a chance to peer through the gate and see the need. Whether they are refugees fleeing wars in countries that I can hardly pronounce and can't even find on the ever-changing map. There are so many whom we could help. And not everyone's needs are that obvious. Not all of the wounds are open and uh, uh, um, drawing the dogs. Sometimes the wounds are internal. And there are those who are tired and lonely and discouraged, who hunger for a different sort of nourishment and care. And we can, like the Good Samaritan in today's script, look for those to whom we can reach out. Not who is my neighbor, but to whom can I be a neighbor? If there is any character in this story with whom I um, am willing to connect, I know that uh, um, in many ways probably most of us resemble the rich man. We may say we're not as rich as others, but by the biblical standards, if we've got the, uh, and Wesley's, if we've got the conveniences of life and some left over, some over. Anyway, the character that I would r rather connect with would be those brothers. Because you see, they've still got time. They still have opportunity. For them, it is not yet too late to pay attention to what the scriptures teach and whether or not their lives are lived in response to that. It's a reminder that I'd better pay attention to whether my life is demonstrably centered in Christ or not. Because you see, in the language of Abraham, we do have the law and the prophets and someone who has come back from the dead. The question for us will be, what will we do about it? Amen. Let us.